Uh, so I'm Julius, I'm one of the co-founders of Prometheus. Um, nowadays I'm freelancing for multiple companies around Prometheus doing various stuffs. Um, some touches the aspect of long-term storage uh, integration in Prometheus. So I'm going to basically tell you a bit today where we are currently and where we're going. This is just a start. <coughs> So historically, Prometheus has only had a local storage. Prometheus stores all its data on local disk. Um, that's complicated enough. <laughs> um, we did it like this uh, very specifically for a reason. Uh, first of all, it's simpler to build, but it's also, it can be simpler to run. You know, if you wipe, want to wipe your storage, you just wipe your local storage directory. It avoids any complicated clustering, especially for a monitoring system that is supposed to be up all the time. Um, having it break down in the face of a network partition when you really need it uh, is a bad idea. Um, and so you can build really highly available Prometheus setups out of just having two Prometheuses that are identically configured, scrape the same data, do both um, alert evaluation in parallel, totally independently from each other. Um, <clears throat> so that's great for this aspect of live monitoring, getting alerted, even if <laughs> it's the fan. But that doesn't cover all use cases. So it's not durable, it doesn't scale forever, it's not horizontally scalable. If you lose one node, you lose all your storage. Um, we have always said that we were at least hesitant to put more advanced features into the local storage, advanced features such as downsampling data, um, because we said, well, it's not really supposed to be a long-term storage anyways. It's not flexible in two ways. Uh, on one hand, uh, it's only storage, but you might want to do something completely different with the incoming samples, like put a stream processor uh, in front of it. Or uh, on the other hand, if you run Prometheus on a cloud-native uh, system like Kubernetes, you might have noticed, okay, like every time I reschedule my Kubernetes pod uh, that has Prometheus in it, my storage history is completely gone unless I use some strategy to mount in uh, persistent storage. Um, so obviously, like we had this idea very early on that it would be nice to have a local storage. This is one of the first Prometheus issues filed ever. I've naively filed it in 2012, within the first months of the project. And we said, okay, well, we want to have something like this eventually. <laughs> uh, I think this issue has by now under over 150 comments. Uh, there was, has been like years and years of discussions, a little, little happening. Um, but we actually started out back then, a couple of years ago, by having um, writes support only, not read back. Uh, into three specific systems, OpenTSDB, InfluxDB, and Graphite. Um, and this was write-only. You could replicate samples that Prometheus scrapes into these systems, and Prometheus would you know, map Prometheus's labeled data model into something that would be adequate for, for these. Um, we don't really like to support a lot of specific systems in Prometheus, though. We want to be as generic as we can. So the goal eventually was to replace the specific support with a generic interface that we define and that anyone can then implement. Um, first for the write path, but then the holy grail would be to also be able to read back data with PromQL through Prometheus. So this posed some design questions. On the write path, we had this kind of argument of do we send entire chunks over? So Prometheus's local storage already chunks samples in every time series and compresses these chunks very nicely? Uh, or do we just send live as we get the samples? Do we send them live over to the remote system? Also, how much buffering and retries do we want to do uh, if the remote end, for example, is just not reachable at the moment? Um, for the read path, the biggest question was, uh, do, we do, do we basically send uh, PromQL fragments to the remote storage nodes and have them compute sub-results and then aggregate those up to enable more scalable queries? Uh, or do we do some kind of centralized evaluation where we get all the time series data into uh, Prometheus at first and then do all the PromQL evaluation in there? And then both of these paths had the question of which protocol and encoding do we use? 
So we really said, okay, we don't want to try to do the perfect thing up front without really having any experience. So we, we decided to, to start simple and then see what users say and go from there. So the right path came first. I think, I don't know how old it is, like a year, the generic one, something like a bit, bit less. Yeah, actually. Six yeah, Six months, right, I remember. Uh, <laughs> So there we had the samples versus chunks questions, right? It would actually be way more efficient uh, network-wise to uh, have the local storage really efficiently compress up many samples for the same series and then send that whole compressed bunch uh, batch of samples over with only the labels and the metric name exactly once. Um, but the problem is then like what chunk size does the remote system actually need? Is it the same chunk size as Prometheus has or a totally different one? Uh, you run into the question of uh, write delay because such a chunk in Prometheus will take hours, sometimes even days, to become full. And the remote end doesn't even have to be a storage system. It could be some kind of stream processor or whatever you want it to be. Um, so we thought, okay, let's keep it simple for now. We are just sending samples, individual samples over. And uh, yeah, that basically enables uh, simple use cases for now. On the buffering and retries front, we wanted to be a bit careful. Um, on one hand, uh, it's um, we actually shard the writer uh, because it tends to be actually a quite high throughput business if you're writing a lot of data to a remote end. Um, Tom, who's way back there, he wrote like a little PID controller that dynamically uh, increases or decreases the number of parallel shards with which we send. Uh, we actually hash the entire uh, fingerprint of a time series into a shard so that uh, every time series always ends up in the same shard so that within one time series we can uh, guarantee in-order delivery of samples, which is important for some systems. We don't want to do too much queuing in this part that writes out samples to the remote storage. Uh, one, because the representation of the samples in there is quite memory intensive and B, because like if we just buffer up too much and retry too much, it might actually use so much memory that it takes down the rest of Prometheus, which is really not what we want. Uh, we still want Prometheus to be like this decoupled, very reliable system that just happens to also talk to a remote storage. Uh, <laughs> the protocol and encoding. Um, we actually started out using gRPC and then hit a snag uh, because some components on the internet and in, in, you know, on, on the path between the Prometheus that was collecting data and the remote storage did not support HTTP2 yet. Uh, there were some gRPC problems with that. Um, so for now, we are doing plain HTTP and protocol buffers, but in the future, probably we'll also uh, enable gRPC um, or even replace the HTTP and protocol buffer. We'll, we have to see about that. Um, so this is what the write path looks. Um, you have a Prometheus server. It runs totally normally. It can have a local storage still if you want to. It doesn't need to. Um, there's a flag to disable the local storage. <coughs> and uh, yeah, the way it works is just it sends every individual sample as it comes over directly to the remote storage. There is some batching, of course, as I mentioned, but not a lot. Um, in the optimal case, you'd have some storage system that really natively inter integrates with this Prometheus remote write protocol and just takes that directly, but more realistically, you'll probably want to write something into an existing storage system uh, where you would have a bridge that gets the sample stream and then it munges that into whatever format your actual system uh, needs. We have uh, an example bridge in the documentation directory of Prometheus, which supports InfluxDB, Graphite, and uh, OpenTSDB. <laughs> um, for the write path. There's no read path there, I have to be careful. Um, or more generally, you could put any arbitrary processor uh, behind that bridge to do whatever you want, you know, Kafka or whatever. Um, <clears throat> so what you write out doesn't necessarily have to be a storage system, doesn't necessarily have to be a system that you read back from. Uh, configuration wise, all you need is uh, a URL in your config. Um, you can also have, so I grade out a bunch of options that are optional, you know, authentication and TLS option, options, 
What's interesting here is you can have relabeling in this path as well. So you can, for example, choose which series to send and which uh, to drop for the remote storage. So on the read path, we had the central, uh, this question around distributed or centralized evaluation. Um, on one hand, the scalability, if, if you want to make really big queries over many time series, over a lot of history, at some point you would need some kind of distributed evaluation, downsampling, uh, aggregation of local results and so on. Um, but that would require some kind of remote knowledge of PromQL constructs or you know you would need to translate PromQL constructs uh, into InfluxQL or whatever you're dealing with. And it would, re it would require more complexity on the remote end. Um, we think that the local evaluation, where you do all the evaluation in the Prometheus that requests the data, uh, is probably good enough for most queries that are not too big. Um, it helps in that case if the remote end supports some kind of downsampling so that you don't request as much data as you know the raw data that you once pumped into it, because that can be quite high, resu quite high resolution. <coughs> so we do the centralized PromQL evaluation. Um, the read path looks like this. We send over to a bridge or even a native system maybe um, a set of time series matchers that are very similar to what you would type in PromQL, you know, equals, unequals, and so on, um, along with ranges of times that we want uh, for this data. Then this bridge talks to whatever backend system there is, gets that data, and sends it back as raw samples um, annotated with metric name and labels. And then all the PromQL evaluation with all that data happens in the Prometheus that requested the data. Uh, in the future, what Brian there wants to enable, I think I got this right, otherwise holler at me, uh, he wants to also add remote read endpoints into Prometheus itself so that Prometheus can remotely read from other Promethei, what's the, Prometheus was the official, like we had to talk about that once, uh, Prometheus servers, um, <laughs> uh, the plural of Prometheus. Um, yeah, and this would enable, for example, if you have a sharded setup where you have 10 Prometheus servers because one doesn't scale and every one of these 10 only scrapes a tenth of its targets in a mod sharded way. Um, currently, to get a kind of global view of some of the data, you would need to put a higher level Prometheus on top of it and do scrape time federation. Uh, this would enable a model where you can uh, actually configure all these sub-Prometheuses as uh, remote read endpoints and then just do it at query time. Different reliability aspects and so on, but at least it's a possibility. There's, there's more possibilities around this where that come from. Uh, again, you just need to configure a URL. Uh, we might want to have service discovery support there in the future, but right now it's just a simple URL and some options for the connection. Note, uh, we still want Prometheus to be this very reliable system for what it's originally meant to do, uh, alerting and you know, real-time monitoring. So alerting rules and recording rules only uh, work against locally collected data. We don't try to depend on a remote system for this kind of very basic uh, important functionality. Um, the metadata, fetching any kind of metadata is only against the local storage for now. So if you want to list all the label names that exist or all the values for a given label name and so on. Um, but we want to also at least have the option of uh, fetching that from the remote side. <coughs> We're going to do some magic uh, based on the external labels of a Prometheus server. A Prometheus server has a set of external labels that identify it against other Prometheus servers that you might run. Um, and so when we write out samples to a remote end, we'll attach external labels, and when they come back, we'll remove them, and when we query, we include them in the query, and so on, so we try to just do the right things there. <coughs> that is not yet in the code base, but will be by next week, hopefully. Um, cool, so let's get to two actual real-world real examples. <coughs> So the first one is Chronix, which is a solar-based 
horizontally scalable long-term storage built by QAware in Munich. And I freelanced a bit with them last year, and they wanted to get Prometheus data into Solar, uh, into Chronix, to be able to do uh, deeper analysis on that, uh, like anomaly detection and so on. <coughs> Um, this only supports the write path for now, though. So there's this ingester which basically takes the generic write format samples, chunks it up, and stores it in a Chronix uh, specific chunk format in, in Chronix. Um, there's no read path there. Uh, what's more interesting, maybe, is the more recent development. I've been working with Weaveworks on Cortex. And uh, this is a system I'm going to talk a bit more about. Um, Cortex supports full read and write. It's a horizontally scalable Prometheus re-implemented in the cloud and it's like API compatible. Um, you can use it through Weave's uh, cloud service, but it's, the back end of it is also open source. So you can run it yourself and you can uh, use it and contribute. There's a link down there. Um, it stores all its data currently in AWS, DynamoDB, and S3, but there's another company also being interested in it at the moment and um, planning to extend it for uh, Google Compute Platform support. Uh, it supports Prometheus's normal querying API. So you, if you want, you can just point a Grafana at it and get you know, remote storage results from there. Uh, but to actually get data into it, uh, it was one of the, or the, the first real user out there uh, also for uh, the write support, because the way it works is you still run a Prometheus locally in your data center that can do the service discovery and pulling of, of targets because you know that's kind of the tough bit. How do you solve that when you want to have a hosted Prometheus? Uh, and then it uses Prometheus's remote write protocol to uh, send samples to, to Cortex. Cortex saves it all. Um, and just as a kind of nice benefit, I recently added uh, the remote read support to Cortex as well. So if you want to, you can now also read back data that you sent to Cortex through the Prometheus through which you sent it. Um, so let's do a quick demo of that. I hope that works. <clears throat> so I'm on the development environment here um, of uh, Weave Cloud. I'm going to the monitor section here, and I hope it. I hope the Wi-Fi is with me today. Da, 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 da. Yeah, this might be a bit difficult, like sending actual samples over the Wi-Fi to uh, the service, but just loaded a second ago. Hmm. I wonder. <laughs> okay, getting started. So right now we're not sending any samples yet. We're getting some instructions here on how to set up Prometheus to send samples to it. Um, but I, and it says no Prometheus found, no instances, no jobs. So I have a local Prometheus here on my laptop. Um, can people read that? I have a remote write section in there and a remote read section. I created a test kind of cloud instance so that if someone copies this key, it wouldn't be too bad. <laughs> <coughs> <laughs> so you can take pictures and stuff, but I'll delete it afterwards. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, so basically all this Prometheus does is uh, it scrapes itself and it scrapes a local node exporter, which is running in this other tab to gather some node, uh, so ho host stats. Uh, it's not a lot of samples. Um, and as you see, there's a push URL and a read URL. And yeah, so let's try that out. Let's start running that Prometheus. It will log some errors because of the network uh, here and some other issues against the dev environment, but hopefully some samples will make it there. Do, do, do. Yeah, so you see like some resharding messages here. So let's see, at some point, this should notice that there are, that there's, ah, Prometheus connected, instances one, jobs one, there should be two jobs eventually. Um, but we can already go to the monitor section. Aha! Let's query for node CPU uh, as a table. Yeah, I misspelled. Cool. We need, oh, actually, we don't have a lot of data yet, and these are counters, so we want to rate them. Mm, five minutes. 
five minutes is a lot if we don't have a lot of data, so let's do maybe one minute for now. Um, so I also have this Prometheus running which actually sends that data there, so there. So if I copy this expression, I should get like roughly something equivalent. Du, du, du. Um, let's do one minute here as well, or five minutes. <clears throat> so it will not look exactly the same right now, probably because of some artifacts. Du, du, du. And yeah, so now it already it queries its local storage, but it also queries the remote storage, which of course now is super slow over the Wi-Fi um, because the Prometheus runs on my laptop. But uh, now the cool thing is, let's see, let's refresh this one more time. Da, 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 da. Query running. Yep, cool. So. Cool, and now the cool thing is, uh, let's kill this Prometheus. Let's hard kill it even, and like totally delete its data directory, and bring it up again, and execute this query again. <clears throat> and we got the data from the remote end. <laughs> Woo! So, this is. I'm glad that worked. <laughs> okay, awesome. Um, of course, what we also so go go forth, uh, try out Weave Cloud, use it, uh, give feedback. Um, but also, we are hoping for people to build their own. Um, right now, it's not documented yet. This is all kind of like the remote read, especially has just been added to master. It will probably be in the next release, and there will also be documentation on Prometheus IO. Uh, hopefully. Yeah, together with the next release. Um, right now, I can only point you at the protocol buffer definition that includes the actual data types that are sent over the wire. There's some snappy compression involved as well. That'll be documented. Um, yeah, so just, yeah, we're curious to see what people do with it and if it's useful. Um, it's all still experimental. Um, this could change. Uh, we'll mark it experimental explicitly. So. Yeah, that, that even though we have a 1.0 or a 2.0, we can still change it without changing the major version. Um, so watch out for the next release for some of these features to actually appear. And thanks. I'll take some questions. Or yeah. <laughs> yep. Yeah, one question. Uh, can you configure, like, put like all the data from local, but months, like sending to remote? So no, right now it's really a live thing. Samples that are scraped at the moment uh, can get sent over live, but we don't do any like old data replication to another system. You could build something that does it for you, but the code for it doesn't exist. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Yep. This is some kind of compression in the In in Cortex, oh yeah, um, we use actually the same chunk compression that we use in Prometheus, um, but the system around it is completely different. It's like replicated, scalable, horizontally, and so on. Um, but yeah, the actual, like the, on the very lowest level, we have Prometheus-style chunks, but they're kind of, we can swap them out if we need to, so, yeah. Tom back there is the mastermind, the one in the blue shirt, he's the master wine be behind uh, Weave Cortex. So like, if you have Weave Cortex specific questions around how that works, that's, that's the guy. Um, any more questions around this? Way back there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. For me, long term storage, that's where it dies, that's where I'll do dashboarding analytics against that long term storage. Remote read, I don't know, something about it. Um, so, oh, Brian, okay. Yeah, right now, it's, we want to be very careful. 
So like if you're doing the expression browser, we'll sure we use what we have to launch. And later on, we'll get rule groups. We have the same thing. This rule group is also allowed to use the book read because I have thought about the trade offs and these alerts aren't that important. So that's okay. And as well for the like, sharded kind of screen conversion uh, with the shards, you'll be able to say, no, no, these are book reads, all is full. Uh, but all these are options, and you'll be able to turn them on. And we just want to make sure people don't get used to using these things in an unreliable way. Yeah, and in general, you ask the question, well, is it worth at all uh, having remote read? And yeah, I mean, at least uh, there's a lot of user demand for it. So far, people have said, well, yeah, great, we can write data into some remote system, but we want to be able to query back through PromQL, because otherwise, now we have to go to a different system to read it back out, and we can't use our normal Grafana dashboards and so on. And now you can, if you use Cortex, for example, you can just uh, reschedule your Prometheus pod pretty much almost at will and still get all the historical data. Um, or if you use some kind of other long-term storage that will spring up. Yeah. Um, yep. Yeah, we don't expect that uh, the usage of the remote read endpoint in Prometheus itself to become like a widespread thing, hopefully. Because that makes things brittle again, uh, because doing query time, you're relying on being able to contact many other systems. Yeah. Mm. Cool. Any more? Oh, oh okay. yep. Maybe I missed this point, but is there a plan to remote write to another system? Uh, the receiver and the, I guess that would have to be a push data. Uh, yeah, it doesn't exist yet, no. Um, I don't know if we want it. Brian will have things to say. He's shaking his head. Uh, so the, the, the thing is... You just run the second Prometheus, get it to the same things. Yeah, like, but the, the common part of pattern there is just to have the, the other Prometheus just scrape the same targets. Um, sometimes that's not possible, but yeah. Cool. Thank you.